cherished. My heart swelled with joy and I feared it would burst the confines of my spindly chest. It sang and danced and frolicked in my breast and later I was to wonder much at this. But for the moment I was pulled along in a rising vortex of exhilaration flooding my senses with warmth and love and yearning and an overpowering sense of being deeply cherished. But perhaps a better place to start the story would be at the beginning. My friend, Sheru, had invited me to an exhibition of clothes, curated by her daughter, whom I had known since before she was born and whom I held close in my heart. The clothes were created by Sheru's niece from Delhi, and the two cousins were taking the show to a number of cities, with one handling the fashion angle and the other handling the business side of things. I'm not very fashion conscious, picking and choosing what trends I follow. Plus, I'm modest and should be at my age, don't you think? I accept that sometimes I look matronly because I don't take too many risks. I'm the kind that wonders if some people even possess a mirror since they wear such wildly inappropriate things. And I can't stand that mutton trying to pass for lamb look with grandmothers vying with their granddaughters for God's sake. So no question of plunging necklines revealing crepey décolletage, dark unmentionables under flimsy blouses or visible panty lines, which last, in case you wondered, just means looser pants, not those ridiculous thong things from which diatribe you will have guessed that I'm not the ideal person to invite to fashion exhibitions curated by one's daughter. If I go to these things at all, I try to look inconspicuous and leave quickly, all of which is well known to Sheru. But nevertheless, she insisted I come. And with Meena being the curator, I could hardly say no. Though she tried telling me I was not to, I felt obliged to buy, and this filled me with dread. Another fine mess I'd got myself into is the line that ran through my head as we drove up. I was praying I would get something suitable. Bless you, my darling, and I hope it's a hugely successful show, I whispered to Meena as I enfolded her in my arms. She whispered back that I wasn't to worry about buying anything. She and Sheru had just wanted me to be there. But she did hope I'd like the clothes because they really were very good. I felt my insides clench with tension and perhaps my outsides clenched too as she burst out laughing and told me to run along and play nicely, the cheeky scamp. Sheru was busy being hostessly, so I spent some time saying hello to sundry people before finally turning towards the clothes racks with an air of entering the lion's den. I was impressed, in spite of my apprehensions. The clothes were elegant and feminine, they were well worked and finely finished, the seams were smooth, not taut and puckered, there were no dangling threads and uneven hemlines, they looked expensive, but a furtive glance at the price tags indicated they weren't prohibitively so and I'd been told they accepted orders which made everything possible. I felt the strain ebb a bit from my body. I decided I might as well enjoy the experience and was leaning in, touching the garments and feeling their fine texture and workmanship. I moved along the racks, stopping, admiring, actually considering if I should order this one or that or perhaps that other more genteel one. I was startled myself by ordering that really very smart, though quite inappropriate for me, one. I slid the hangers along the rack, more than a little surprised that I was actually having a good time. I heard Sheru call my name and turned around to find her hauling a young lady towards me. Must be the Delhi cousin, I thought. And so it turned out to be. 
I congratulated the young girl and told her how much I liked the clothes. Sheru hooted with delight and told her that I was a very tough customer, which, sad to say, I am. And if I was pleased, she was home and dry. I was telling her which ones I liked and she asked, Have you seen the coats? And I told her I hadn't. But in our hot tropical climate, I hardly needed one and it would be a sheer waste. All the while, she was chattering and ushering me along when suddenly my eyes fell upon this rapturous red coat. And all at once I completely understood Wordsworth and how he felt about those golden daffodils we'd studied about in school. My heart sang out. It danced and twirled and swooped under my ribs, thrilling me with an excitement that left me breathless and gasping with a delirious happiness and a tender sensation of being dearly loved. The coat was so gorgeous that everything around it was in a haze and I could see only this and nothing else. I rushed towards it on fairy feet, now dragging the Delhi cousin along in my wake. I saw my hands tremble as they reached out towards the coat. I already felt embraced by it, cocooned, comforted and loved as a child in her mother's arms. It felt softer than an angel's kiss, finer than spider silk, and I wanted it fiercely. It just had to be mine. I had never felt this way about clothes. My mind told me it was just a coat with Chinese embroidery. But my heart told me I would rather die than give it up. I touched it gently, gently, just barely skimming my fingers over it and felt it suffuse my body with unnameable, fluttery emotions. I could smell a deliciously familiar fragrance and I buried my face in the softness of it. I was completely bereft of words. It was an overpoweringly pure sensation, a kind of soft, sweet ecstasy. I don't know how to describe it. It was overwhelming. The cousin got swiftly into the act. She'd taken the coat down from the stand and helped me shrug into it. I felt like I had come home and I would have just stood there like a moon calf for ages. I could hear her in the background muttering away something about it being from an old pattern, but I wasn't really listening. She had the matter entirely in hand and hustled me gently to a mirror. Her fingers plucked and nipped and tucked at the coat. It needed a little taking in here and a shortening there. She pulled out pins from her sleeve and started sticking them into the coat. She was very skillful, for in a few quick jabs, she had converted the coat into a custom-fitted garment. I stood there, looking at my reflection and thinking how heavenly it was and how fortunate I was to have laid my hands on it. She showed me the price tag and acknowledged it was scandalous enough to make a sailor blush. But I was entitled to a very special and secret 20% off. She needn't have bothered with that discount. I could no more have let go of that coat than stop breathing. Sheru rushed across urgently to whisper that I didn't have to buy the most expensive thing in the whole show. Where was I going to wear it in our winter? I had a hard time convincing her that I wasn't doing her a kindness. Meena gave me a crushing hug and called me a real trooper. Only the cousin noticed my reluctance to surrender the coat, even for alterations. I put down a small deposit, all I had at the moment, and promised to bring the rest when I collected it the next day. She assured me it would be a perfect fit. But it was already perfect to me. I had a few customary hors d'oeuvres and went back into the salon and glanced at the blue coat they'd put up instead of my red one. Tja, not a 
patch, if you'll permit me my say. And finally, I was on my way home. As the thundering emotions ebbed, I wondered what had come over me. To pay a minor Pasha's ransom for a coat I could hardly ever use? Immediately, another part of me rose up like a fiery demon ready to defend my choice. Well, I could afford it, and I was going to have it. I reassured the demon, restoring peace inside my head. I had to admit that I really, really wanted that coat. It made me feel very special, not just glamorous and elegant and stylish. Somehow, loved and adored and cherished. And how a coat could do all that was more than I could say. So I collected it the next day and it fit perfectly, hugging me with exactly the correct snugness. And I brought it home and laid it gently on my bed in its white muslin cover. I stroked it lovingly and tried it on in front of my mirror and it had lost none of its magic at home. I only put it away because I had to. But I'll admit honestly that I often took it out and put it on, even just over my nightdress, and enjoyed feeling special in it and smelling the delicious smell of love that always came with it. And so, when the time came to attend my great nephew's wedding, knowing it's December and it gets cold here, I think you know what was the very first garment I decided to take along. The rest of my wardrobe had to fit around it. I'd taken off the muslin cover and hung it up on a padded satin hanger so the creases would fall out. I was methodically putting away all my stuff on the shelf they had cleared for me in the cupboard. It was lovely to be back in the bosom of our bustling family again. I was pottering away happily when my sister came bursting in already berating me for tiring myself out or some other such thing. But she stopped dead mid-sentence, which is not like her. So I looked to see what had alarmed her. She was standing there, goggle-eyed, gawping at my beautiful red coat. I was delighted to see it had taken the wind out of her sails too. But she accosted me with big burning eyes. When did you get mum's coat? She asked in a jealous hiss. Suddenly, all the misaligned pieces fell into place. Of course, it was Mum's coat. Now everything made sense. Our Mum had had a red coat just like this with Chinese embroidery. I don't know what became of it because obviously this was not that very one. We two little sisters would see Mum all dressed up to go out with her high heels and exotic perfume and upswept hair and jewels twinkling in her ears and this gorgeous red coat. And we'd admire how impossibly glamorous she looked, not like the strict Mum who watched over us all day. And she'd call us and scratch down on her haunches in her beautiful dress or sari and this marvellous coat and give us each a tight hug that lasted forever. I'd felt completely safe in her arms, folded in the softness of that silky coat, watching her enticing, dangling earrings engulfed in the gentle whiff of her perfume and her softly whispered, I love you, in my ear. Dad would be standing by looking imposing and handsome in jet black and he'd give us each a whiskery nuzzle before shooing us off to bed and we'd scoot off, waving and blowing kisses at them. How could I possibly have forgotten all that? The coat had evidently called to me with the long silenced voice of my beloved mum, with her kindness and sweetness. It spirited me back to my innocent childhood where I was surrounded and protected by her love and dad's, and knowing nothing of tragedy to come and completely confident that the world was full of love and wonder and that I would be forever cherished.